Hello everyone, my name is Dean and welcome to this week's 20 and 20 episode. I know this is a little late uh, and there's only one episode this week. I had a lot going on. I barely even managed to get this one out. Uh, I lost power halfway through recording this the first time, so you know, here we are. Uh, but today we're going to be looking at creating a game with a high score feature. Uh, so we're making a basic uh, tic-tac-toe game, but we're going to be adding high scores so that your wins, losses, and ties can be seen on a high scores page where you can like rank and sort by uh, who's got the most wins and stuff like that. So it's sort of like a um, like a basic hello world into making a game high score system in Rails. Uh, we're using tic-tac-toe because it's one of the fastest things I could think to implement. It still ended up being, you know, an hour long episode. Uh, but hopefully this gives you some ideas for if you want to make your own game and how you want to like set things up uh, for like your high scores. So yeah, that's the basic idea. We'll use Devise, Bootstrap, you know, all that other good stuff we normally use. Um, and then we'll, you know, dive into some JavaScript. How do you use P5.js for something like this? So yeah, we're using P5.js, uh, which allows us to do a whole bunch of fancy stuff that saves us a lot of time, like, you know, the draw loops and all that stuff, which you normally have to do manually. Here we're, you know, handling it uh, with P5.js. So yeah, we're covering third-party libraries, games, high scores, and all that other good stuff, remote calls, uh, so hopefully you guys get some value out of this, but that's enough from me. Let's go ahead and let's jump into some code. Okay, so this is going to be my second attempt at recording this. Um, we're going to start by adding in some gems that we're going to be using in a minute here. So the first one we'll add, of course, is devise. And then we're also going to add simple underscore form. And then we'll save our gem file. Uh, we can then come over to our terminal and run a bundle install command to install both of those gems. Let's now run a rails g devise colon install command to install devise. Let's now run a rails g devise user command to create our user model. Let's now run a rails g um, simple underscore form colon install hyphen hyphen bootstrap. So that's going to install simple form with the bootstrap flags. Uh, now let's do a Rails G Devise Views to generate our Devise Views. And we can now do a Rails uh, DB colon migrate command to migrate the database. And we can now do a Rails G controller pages. And we need a couple pages here. We're going to do a home page, a game page, and a high scores page. Okay, so that takes care of that. Let's now come into our config and our routes.rb. And we're gonna set the root to be the pages controller home action. Uh, the get for both of these is fine, but we're also going to need a post to, uh, we're gonna just call this slash played. And we're gonna say to the pages controller and the played action. Uh, and we're going to use this for once the game is over, we're going to post to the pages controller uh, to update the score for the user. So if the user wins or loses, we'll add that on there. Which reminds me, uh, I don't think we've remembered to do this, but we can just create a migration for this. Uh, let's say Rails G migration, add underscore score underscore to underscore user. And we're going to give the user a wins, which is an integer a losses, which is an integer, and a ties, which is an integer. And then we can run that migration. And before you run the Rails, or before you run the migration, sorry, we generated it, but before we run it, let's come into our DB migrate and the second migration right here. And for all three of these, uh, we're gonna wanna do something like default colon zero. So the default value is gonna be zero. Uh, and if you're on a Windows, you can hold Alt inside of VS Code to work on multiple lines like that. So let's save that. And then once that's done saving, uh, which my computer seems to be struggling, presumably because it's not too happy with me losing power during the last recording, uh, we can then do a Rails DB colon migrate command to migrate the database. And now we can do a yarn add bootstrap jQuery and popper.js. And while that's running, we can come into our config, webpack, environment.js, and we need to add in our usual bootstrap stuff here. So I have covered this in a video before, so if any of this isn't familiar, 
Um, I'll link to a card that covers how to do this bootstrap and Rails 6 stuff. So you can just check that out in the top right up here probably. Uh, or you can just search bootstrap 6 Dean in. Uh, both of those would work. So we need to create the webpack, then we say environment.plugins.append, provide, comma, and we're going to enter down. We're going to say new webpack.provide plugin. And then for this, we're going to, I'm going to hit escape to avoid that. So we need the dollar sign, which is going to be for jQuery. We also need jQuery, which is going to be jQuery. And then we need popper, which is going to be, um, this takes in an array, I believe, of popper.js and default. I think we're actually getting to the point where I'm starting to remember how to do this. Uh, that's probably not the best thing. <laughs> uh, let's now come into our app, our JavaScripts, packs, application.js file. And in here, we need to do an import for bootstrap, and we need to do an import uh, dot slash style sheets slash application dot scss and then we'll save this and then in our packs folder we'll create a new folder call it style sheets and in there we'll create a new file and call it application dot scss and in here we need to just do an at import tilde bootstrap slash scss slash bootstrap save that Okay, and I think that's about it for all of that. So let's come to, let me actually close this, or I'll just go to Google. Uh, that way you guys can see how I do this. So we go to Google and we'll search for Bootstrap for documentation. And we'll find a link here for the Git Bootstrap where the docs are at least version four. We'll say introduction. And then we'll just search for navbar. Grab the navbar, scroll down, and we'll copy this one right here. And then we'll come into our app views, oops, views, layouts, and we'll create a new file in here and we'll call this underscore navbar.html.erb. And it's got an underscore there because it's a partial, which means we can come into application.html.erb. And above this yield tag, which is what causes all the individual pages to render, we can say on every single page, let's do a render for the uh, layout slash navbar. And we don't have the underscore here because it's a partial, but here it does have the underscore. So Rails sort of understands what we're going for here. And if we do all of that, and we didn't mess up with anything, and considering we've now been typing commands and stuff for about seven minutes, uh, it's kind of stretching it. But if we come over here and we come to the root of the application and Webpacker compiles, all of this should hopefully work, maybe. Uh, but while that's running, we can come into our app controllers, pages controller. And I'm sorry if you can hear my computer right now. Uh, it seems to be running at like every single cylinder. <laughs> okay, so here we have our, uh, our nav bar showing. So our bootstrap is working. Uh, but let's come into our pages controller and let's just set this whole thing up right now so we don't have to deal with this later. So the first thing we want to do is uh, do our before action. So before any of these actions, like the home, game, or high scores, we can, we can call a function. And device comes with authenticate user as one of the functions, which is basically saying, uh, make sure the user is logged in. So before any action in this controller happens, except for the home action, tell the user they need to sign in. Uh, if they are signed in, this won't fire. So it, it'll just be like, oh, yep, you're good. Keep going, chief. Uh, but, you know, for the game and the high scores, and we also have that played action that we created, uh, which doesn't have a view associated with it. It's just something that we're going to be using remotely. Uh, but for any of these three, this authenticate user is going to fire. So if you want to play a game, you have to be signed in. If you want to go to the high scores, you have to be signed in. I guess that doesn't make sense. So let's also add the high scores to that. Because uh, I don't see why you would need to be signed in for the high scores. So uh, you could also say like only and then change this to uh, game and played. But in this case, if you add in something else, it's usually better to just, you know, safe than sorry. Uh, but the other thing we want to do is say before action, let's set the stats except for the home page. Uh, and we can just declare that real quick. So down here in private, we'll say def set stats end. 
And in here, we just want to say at wins equals current underscore user, which is just the uh, user you're logged in as. At losses equals the current user dot losses. And at ties equals the current user dot ties. So it looks like because of this, uh, yeah, so you would need this for the home. So we're going to also say uh, accept the high scores for this. Uh, so we want to say set the stats except for home and the high scores, although I don't know if we're using it for played. So we could even for this one just say only do this for the uh, game. That might also work. So now that we have that, let's come into uh, our high scores real quick. And in here we can say at users equals user dot order by the wins in descending order. So uh, the highest win person will be on top. And then for the played, we want to say something like current user dot wins plus equals one if params win. And we're going to pass in these params from our uh, game page. So don't worry about that. Uh, it's not something we've created yet. We're just preemptively saying if you get these parameters, handle them like this. Uh, and then we'll say current underscore user dot ties plus equals one if params ties, or I guess tie because we're doing singular for everything. And then we'll say current user dot save. So that's our played action. We also have our um, set stats and everything else looks good in here. So let's uh, exit out of this pages controller for now. And I'm actually going to close all of these windows because there's too much noise going on here right now. Uh, so let's start in our app, views, pages, and the home page. So in here, let's do something like a uh, container. And let's actually give this like a margin top of five. And let's just leave it like that for now. And then here, let's do a uh, dot jumbotron. And we'll just say h1 tick tack go. So this is our home home pages home title. And then we'll give it like a, a subtitle that just says week sevens project for the 20 and 20 challenge exclamation uh, and then below that we can do something like uh, check if we're logged in as uh, a current user so if current user else and oops let me just space that over okay so if we're logged in then we want to say link to play a game this is going to be the game path that we created earlier. Then let's give this a BR tag. And then let's say uh, you can also log out from here. So link to log out, which is going to be the destroy user session path with a method of delete. And then down here, if we're not logged in, we want to say link to create an account and then uh, new user registration path. Create a BR tag, and then we'll also do a link to the login page, which is the new user session path. And that takes care of all of that, and we can save this, and hopefully that updates our home page. Looks good. Let's maybe give this jumbotron a text align of center so style equals text align center does that work yeah that looks a little bit better okay so that takes care of that let's go ahead and let's create an account i'll say dean at example.com with a password of oops password of password and i just turned on caps lock so let me just sign up like that Undefined local variable or method game path. Let me come into uh, my config and my routes.rb because I feel like I know what the problem is. Yeah, so let's, instead of saying pages slash game, let's change this to be the games controller and the, or the, the pages controller and the game path. Because I don't want to have to go to slash pages slash game to be able to play. I just want to go to slash game. And similar for the high scores, 
I'll just say to the pages controller and the high scores action and the played is fine I think so if I do that and then I wait for this to save and refresh that should get rid of those errors so now we have that let's now clean up our nav bar so we're going to be in the nav bar for a little bit here so let's come into layouts and our nav bar at html.erb and I'm going to full screen this because this one's usually a bit of a doozy it's a bit redundant but I like to show this in every video just so that you sort of get the hang of this so the first thing we're going to do is replace this uh, nav bar link with a proper rails link so I'll say link to uh, tick tack go which is our logo name so we're going to call this the root path and give this a class of nav bar hyphen brand we can get rid of this home link or i guess just replace it with a rails link so let's say link to the home page which is the root path which has a class of nav hyphen link uh, this drop down we can actually cut out of here and then we can delete this disabled link and then down here we can get rid of the search form and create a ul with a class equal to navbar hyphen nav and instead of mr uh well let's actually leave it as mr so i can show you what that looks like and why you don't want to use that so i'll leave it as mr and then i'll just paste in this drop down and let's get rid of this word drop down here and replace this with uh, current user dot email which means we're going to have to say if current user do this drop down else you're not the current user so you're not signed in so let's do just two li's like this one so one two and then we'll get rid of this one and we'll say uh, link to create an account new user registration path class of what was it nav hyphen link i think and then we'll just copy this and we'll paste it down here and instead of create an account we'll say log in and instead of new user registration path this is going to be new user session path but let's take a look at this drop down real quick so i'll save that and then i'll refresh so our nav bar changes you can see how this like email right here which is great that it's there but it's in the middle now uh, and the reason for that is if we come back into here we need to change this mr to an ml for margin left because margin right is saying fill this up with an automate automatic amount of margin if we change this to ml this margin right here goes right here and pushes this whole thing over to the right so if i refresh now this gets pushed over to the right but we're going to run into a different problem if i click on this oh well, this is a bad example because uh <laughs> It's not quite sized appropriately, but if I move this over in some way, maybe like right here, let me refresh. Uh, and let me change this from the email to just like my name. So I'll just say Dean right here, right? So I'll save that refresh. If I click on this now and my username or my email is small, this dropdown gets knocked off the page and it causes a scroll bar to appear, which means your nav bar stops right here. And this is just blank, empty space. Uh, and the way to change that is if you come into this div where you have the actual dropdown right here. So you can see this is the actual dropdown menu. You can then add another class called dropdown hyphen menu hyphen right to say that this is a right drop down menu and that will fix this issue now it's pushed over even with dean right here uh, but maybe we don't want the email and maybe we don't want to have to hard code the name because that's good for exactly one user so let's create some prototype usernames uh, i have covered creating usernames like this before in my first device tutorial uh, i've also covered how to create usernames that allow you to actually um, log in with the username so i'll also uh, I'll link a card to that video uh, but since we're in here we can use the current user and instead of saying dot email let's say dot username and then let's go stub this out real quick so if we come into app models user dot rb we can create like a fake username that'll just allow us to see what it looks like to have usernames uh, but you won't be able to log in with these and for this we can just say return the email dot split split it at the at symbol get the first element of that array and then call capitalize on it uh, and I'll do my usual shtick here so we have an email like dean at example.com we call split on it which gives us an array with two elements dean 
and then example.com. And we grab the first element of that, which is going to be Dean. We call dot capitalize on it, which gives us Dean. So if we save that, our nav bar now has an ability to call current user dot username, and that's going to give us the username there. So if I just refresh, you can see this change to the capital D Dean, and now that is dynamic across all the counts, and it'll run just off the email addresses. Let's now give this some drop down options here. So let's start with um, maybe we want to. I don't know, uh, let's say play a game from the drop down. So link to play a game, game path, and this needs a class of drop down hyphen item. So that works. We can also copy this down here and down here. This will be our um, account settings. And for this, we need to say edit underscore user underscore registration underscore path. And for this one, let's make this the sign out link. So we'll say log out. This needs to be the destroy user session path. Oops, path with the P. And this needs a method colon colon delete and then a comma after it. And that'll allow us to log out there. So if I save all of that and I refresh this page, if I click on the drop down, we now have a link to the game path. We have a link to the account settings path path. Uh, and we have the ability to log out here. And then I can log back in uh, using my email, but not the username because it's not a loginable username. It's also not a word loginable probably, but you know what I mean. Uh, let's add a couple more links up here and then we can get to work on the actual game, I think. So right here we have this, uh, this link uh, stub link right here. Let's just uh, do something like this and then let's grab this home link and we'll just paste this in a few times. I think we only need it twice actually. So we can get rid of this li. So this first one will be um, play a game and this down here will be the high scores. And you could just have these links in one place, but this sort of shows you how like you can have different things like the play a game link in your drop down and maybe not in your nav bar, or you can just have like redundancies, which, you know, encourages user conversions uh, because the more times you're exposed to something, the more likely you are to do it. Right. So this, you know, this will give you your links, but now we need to change the actual uh, root path here to a game path. And this should be the high scores path. So if we save that and refresh. We can now go to high scores, play a game, and the home page. Okay, so all of that's good. Let's now come over to play a game and let's actually get these games going, right? Okay, so this is going to be a bit more involved than usual when it comes to the JavaScript we do on this channel. Uh, but we're going to get rid of everything in here and start from scratch. So the first thing we're going to do is use p5.js because that's a very, very easy to use and understand uh, game library. So if you come over to p5.js, p5.js.org, you'll have like a download link, the libraries and references. You also have this editor, which allows you to run it just straight off the website. Uh, so right here they have a... They have two functions, the setup function and the draw function. One is to create the canvas in your setup, and then this one just draws a background to it. If you hit run over here, your preview will have that background. So if I set this to like zero for black, I think this will just be pure black. 220 will give you this gray background. So that's the basic gist of the P5.js uh, setup. What we're going to do is we're going to use a CDN. Uh, and if you go to p 5 js.org so p5js.org yep leave i don't care about my changes and i think download and then in here you should find something for the cdn somewhere maybe you just full screen this uh cdn so this is a link to the statically hosted file which is your libraries and you want to grab this bottom one right here which is the default file of course so we'll just copy that so let me uh, move this back over so we're going to say script which will have a src equal to that link and then we'll close this script tag so that's going to import the p5.js for us 
uh, now full screen to start working on this. So let's start with a div and a class of container, and we're going to give this a style equal to text align center. In here, we're going to create an h1 and give this an ID equal to score text. Uh, and this can also have a text align of center. Of course, you could style this, you know, give this a class, make the text align a class. Uh, but we're just trying to get through this because we do have about 200 lines of JavaScript to go through. Uh, and in here, we're going to call pluralize for the at wins, win, slash pluralize for the at losses, loss. And then we're going to say uh, pluralize for the at ties, ties, uh, just tie because the pluralize will handle that. Uh, so there is an edge case we're going to run into here, which is going to be a bit of a problem. But we then have the div with the style equal to font size 32 pixels and an ID equal to result. And then we can go ahead and close this div. Uh, so now we can create our script tags. And this is where the bulk of our application is going to be. You could, of course, move this somewhere else. Uh, the issue is p5.js is going to rely on a sketch.js file, which you can see on the p5.js editor website. So if we come on the p5.js editor, and if you pop right here, you click this little arrow, you can see the files it has. It needs the sketch.js right here uh, to run properly. And the issue with Rails is it's going to compile that. And it's going to give you a digested name, which is going to be something like sketch.js and then like a whole bunch of random garbage behind it. And I haven't really found a way to make p5.js understand that like we need that to work. So you would probably need a gem for that uh, and to do a little bit more legwork there, which I just felt was a little bit beyond the scope of this, uh, this video. So uh, we're just going to skip that for now. But I'm going to, uh, I guess we can start by just creating this... Um, canvas that they have in the sketch.js. So let's come into our script tag here. And let's say uh, function setup, which is where we create the canvas, which is 400 by 400 in their example. And then we'll say function draw. And in here, we want to draw a background of let's make it zero just so it's really obvious that that's what we're doing. So if we do that, and then we come over here and we refresh, here's our canvas, and here's our wins and losses. So if I change this to 220, hopefully this will be a little bit more gray. Looks like that worked. Uh, and now we're ready to get started. So first thing, we have a whole bunch of variables to declare. We need a canvas. We need a board. Uh, we need a variable to uh, decide what the human is. So in this case, the human is an O. And the computer is going to play the X's. And the X's and O's may haunt you, but that's a song for another time. Uh, we then have a current player, which we'll use to switch back and forth between whose turn it is. We have a variable for the um, available moves, which is just going to be an empty array for now. We have a variable for the node width and for the node height. And these are going to be three because you have like three nodes, basically. Uh, so we need to split the canvases width and height into three. Uh, we then have three, I think, or two different document elements we need to get. The first is going to be the result text, which is going to be equal to document document dot get element by ID result. You then have a var for the score text, which is going to be a document dot get element by ID. This is going to be the score text we created earlier. We then have a variable for the canvas offset, which is equal to the result text dot get bounding client rect dot bottom which is going to basically just get the bottom of the result text and um, work off that position so we can make our canvas responsive. We're then going to say var winner, which is, of course, going to be our winner. 
uh, a boolean to say if the game is in progress, and then we have a score which we can actually set equal to parse int. And for each of these, we're going to parse the at wins, comma, parse int, the at losses, and all of this is coming from our controller, of course, uh, the stuff we declared at the start of this video, and then we also have the at ties. Oops, and that looks good. We'll add a semicolon right here. And now we can get started. So instead of having this setup function here, um, what I like to do is, you know, have some logic in the setup and then have some logic in a new game function just so that I can separate the two and then I can call new game whenever I want to create a new game instead of calling setup because that wording doesn't really make sense. So in the setup function, instead of saying create canvas 400 by 400, we're going to set our canvas variable to be equal to create canvas. And instead of 400 by 400, we're going to say make it the window width, which is provided by P5JS. And we're going to say the window height minus our canvas offset that we just uh, grabbed times two, which is just going to push the canvas down a little bit below our uh, result text. We then have the node width, which is equal to the width divided by three, the node height, which is equal to the height of the canvas divided by three. We're then going to create a function called center canvas, and then we'll call new game, which is our function for stuff we should do at the start of the game. So let's uh, start by creating the center canvas because it's the first function we call. So for this, we'll say function, center canvas. This doesn't take any parameters uh, and we just set two things. So the first is our canvas X, which is just equal to the entire window width minus the width of the canvas divided by two and our canvas Y, which is equal to the window height minus the height of the canvas divided by two plus the canvas offset. And then we do a canvas dot position for the canvas X and the canvas Y. And that is it for our center canvas. Uh, the other thing we can do here is call a P5JS for the uh, resize event. So this is a function it provides. And for this, you can call uh, resize canvas. And for this, we just wanna pass in the same things we did for the create canvas, but now the window width and the window height are different. So we can just do that. We'll then reset the node width, which is equal to the width divided by three. And of course you could abstract this into a function uh, in its own so that you're working a bit more dry, you know, don't repeat yourself. But here we then call center canvas again, and then we call this draw grid function that we haven't created yet. So this draw grid will deal with, uh, I guess we can just do it right now. It's not that big of a deal. So we'll just say function draw grid. We just use this to draw the four lines. So this is provided by P5JS again to draw a line. Uh, so we have the node width, which is our X one. We have zero, which is our Y one. Our node width is our X two, and our height is our um, Y two. So you can sort of see this draws a line at the first node width from zero to the height of uh, the canvas, so it's going to be straight vertically, I believe. And then we need to do one that's over, so it's going to be our node width times two, still zero, node width times two, and then it's going to be our height again. So if we save that, <coughs> and I don't know if this is going to run into any errors, I'm sure it will. Yeah, so we're not doing our draw call yet, so we'd have to do our draw uh, to deal with this, I believe. So inside of our draw function, which is down here, let's call draw grid, just so that we can hopefully hear or see this. Yeah, so here you can see our vertical lines being drawn. Let's now draw these horizontal lines, which is going to look similar, similar to these two, but for the horizontals. So we'll start with a line. It's going to be from zero to the node height, to the width and node height, 
And then for the second one, it's going to be zero for our X one, the node height times two, of course, for the Y one. And it's gonna to be to the width and then node height times two again. If we do that and we refresh, that should be both of our horizontal lines. So you can see here, we already have our tic-tac-toe board. That's not too bad. Okay, so let's move that up and then let's come up to, I think we have to do our new game function now. Uh, so in our new game function, we have a couple things to deal with. The first we're gonna call is no loop, which basically stops this um, loop from running that keeps drawing this. We then set our result text to be, and we set the inner HTML to be the empty string because we no longer have a result. Our result text is supposed to say like winner X or you know something like X wins, right? So if I refresh this, I don't know if that'll, yeah. So X wins or it'll say O wins or it'll say, you know, tie, for example. So when we first start a new game, this should be blank because we don't care who won the last game anymore. So we'll just, you know, set it to be the empty string. We then need to initialize our board, which is going to be, a you know, an array containing three arrays. And each one of these is just going to be the empty string for each of our spaces. So you have this, we then add a comma, do another one, and then another one. So this, you know, you can sort of see how one of these corresponds to one of these sections on the board. So now that we've done that, we can set our available spaces to be equal to the board, although I'm not sure if that's necessary. Um, a lot of this isn't going to be the most efficient code. We're just trying to get something that sort of demos a high score system. Uh, we then set the current player to be equal to a random, which is provided by P5JS, between an array of the human and computer. So it'll just select one of these two. So either X or O will go first. And then once we've done that, we can say the game in progress Boolean is now equal to true. And we call loop, which starts our draw loop. So if I do all of that, nothing will happen here because we don't have anything else coded up yet that says, you know, if I click, do this, or like the computer's turn isn't set up yet, none of that, but our board is working. And you can see when I like resize the window, it's, you know, being responsive, which is really cool. So let's go ahead and after we do the new game, the setup, the center canvas, uh, window resize, the draw grid, let's do our actual draw function. So below the draw grid, let's set a stroke weight to be equal to four, which we're gonna use for um, first, like pumping up these lines a little bit. So the first thing we wanna do here is we're going to create two for loops. So we're gonna say four, let i equal zero. i is less than three, i plus plus. So you can see here we're iterating over each of these. And then we're gonna say four, let j equal zero. j is less than three, j plus plus. And in here is where all the magic's gonna happen. So our i's go across, our j's go down. So like if i is one and j is one, we're right here. If i is two and j is one, we're right here. Or if J is two or right here, J is zero is right here. So that's sort of how we're doing this. Um, so we're gonna say let X equal the node width times I plus the node width divided by two. So what does this mean? Well, let's consider a few cases here just so that this is kind of clear. Um, if I equals zero, then X equals well, node width times zero is just zero, so the node width doesn't matter. It's gonna be zero plus the node width, which is from here to here, because that's how we set these lines, divided by two. So it's this space divided by two. If i is one, it's gonna to be to this line, plus another node width, which is this line, divided by two, because you're not dividing the first node width by two. If i is two, it's to this point, plus another node width divided by two. So that's how we're gonna set things into the middle of these squares. We'll do that for the i and the x and the j and the y. So let's create the y right now. So say let y equal the node height 
times j plus the node height divided by 2. Oops, divided by 2. Now we need to create like a spot for that. So for that we can say let spot equal board at i j. So we're just, you know, grabbing whatever's there and um, setting that into the spot. We now need an x radius and a y radius, which we're just going to use for creating the lines in our x's. Uh, we don't need this for the O because we're just going to be using a basic ellipse for that. But um, yeah, so our node width, node width divided by 4, and then let Y radius equal our node height divided by 4. Cool. Now let's use our spot. So if our spot is a human, so if it contains an O, then we need to call no fill, which is just something from P5.js. Uh, and if you're familiar with, you know, your JavaScript stuff for drawing shapes, you're probably more than familiar with these things. Uh, but we're going to pass in our X and our Y, which is going to position it in the middle. And then we're going to make it, uh, the size is going to be the node width divided by 2 and the node height divided by 2. Getting a little ahead of myself there with my fingers. So if I save this alone... Nothing should happen here, but if I come up to our board and I put like an O somewhere, I wonder if that will, yeah, so that'll draw it. So let's also add an X somewhere, oops, and go back to our game, add an X somewhere, save that. Uh, we're not drawing it yet. So you can see that's sort of a problem. Also, we have an extra comma here. I don't know why the formatter feels the need to do that, or if I did that maybe when I was copying and pasting. So now let's draw in our x. So else if the spot is equal to the computer, which is an x, that's just what we set up at the top with our string, then we want to draw a line, and our x1 is going to be at x, which is our halfway point, minus our x radius, which is how long we want it to be. So we want it to be like a quarter of a node width. To our y radius, or our y minus our y radius. So same deal there. Those are our x ones and our y ones. We then want to say x plus the x radius and y plus the y radius. So if I just save this, you'll see what this one line looks like. So it just creates this slash. And now we have to do the opposite, which is going to start from up here and down to the left. So we'll move down a line. We'll create a line. This one's going to go from x plus the x radius, y minus the y radius again. And it's going to be x minus the x radius because we're not moving the y here. We're only moving our x's to get this to draw this x. And now that'll draw this one. Cool. So that takes care of drawing both of our shapes here. Now we need to come down one brace, two brace, three braces. So it looks like about right here. And we want to say if game is in progress and uh, this check winner function, which we haven't created yet, and the current player is equal to human, is equal to computer, sorry. Uh, then we want to call next turn. And next turn is just going to be how our computer decides what to do. Uh, we can now do something for our player. So we're not going to use this next turn right now. Uh, we're going to start by creating the ability for the player to actually make their move. So we'll say function mouse pressed, which P5.js will handle for mouse clicks. If game is in progress and we check the winner and the current player is equal to human, and why are we doing it in this order? Well, the first, the very first thing we want to check is, is there a game in progress? Uh, you're not checking for a winner if the game isn't in progress. That just doesn't make sense. You might run into a null issue. If the game is in progress, then check if someone has won. If nobody has won the game yet, then check if there's a current player, uh, who it's set to, if it's set to human. If it's the human, then we're good to go into this loop. The other thing we want to do is we want to make sure that if I'm clicking up here or you know in my drop down, I'm not accidentally making a move here. 
So we're gonna make sure that the mouse is inside this canvas when we click. And that's pretty easy to do because P5.js has quite a few things to work with here. Uh, we can use mouse X and check that it's greater than or equal to zero and mouse Y and check that that is greater than or equal to zero. And all we're doing here, the mouse X and the mouse Y, we're just checking to make sure that it's greater than this line right here, which is gonna be down, and that it's greater than this line right here, which is gonna to be to the right. We now need to handle the other edge and the bottom. So let's do that. We'll say, and make sure that the mouse X is less than or equal to the entire width of the canvas, and make sure that the mouse Y is less than or equal to the entire height of the canvas. And now that we've done all of that, we are free to finally begin uh, converting this mouse position safely into our node position, which we just do by converting the mouse X uh, over the no node width. And then we say J is equal to floor for the mouse Y divided by the node height. And we're just doing that to make sure uh, that this is going to give us an integer value of 0, 1, or 2. And then we need to say, if this move is available, so we need to create a function that says uh, move available, i, comma, j. If it's available, so if that function returns true, then the i, j position in our board is now equal to human, which is an o, so we placed an o and then we set the current player to be equal to the computer, which is just an X. And that takes care of that. So now let's come down and say, uh, we can now click what happens if we want to reset the game. So for this, we can use a key released function to listen for a key being released. And we'll say if key code is equal to 32, which is the space bar, call new game, which is why it's so nice to have this new game in its own function. Uh, just a note here, spacebar equals key 32, and it does have a bug-ish. It's sort of a feature. If you hold space, you scroll down the page. Uh, so if for some reason you do get a scroll bar here and you hit space to restart the game, you might scroll down and it might be a little bit buggy. So maybe don't use space for this. Uh, I just used it because it was the first thing I could think of. Uh, we already have our draw grid, of course. Let's now create a function that we can use as like a helper for checking if there's a winner. And for this, we'll create a function called equals three, which takes in three arguments because there's three nodes we need to check. We need to check like, you know, position i equals zero, i equals one, i equals two, or j equals zero, j equals one, j equals two, or like the diagonal. So for this, we can just say return a equals b and b equals c. Uh, because A is either going to be a space, a X, or an O. But we want to make sure this isn't blank, right? Because if it's blank, that doesn't mean someone won. That just means no one's played there yet. So then the last thing we'll do is we'll check to make sure that A does not equal the empty, which Im is implied that B then does not equal the empty, and C does not equal B, which does not equal A, which does not equal the empty string. So you can see how our logic works there to check all of the cases. So we can use that in this next function, which is going to be called check winner. And this is probably one of the biggest functions we'll write here. For this, we want to set the winner variable we created originally to be null. We're going to let open spots equal zero. We're going to let the result, which we uh, aren't using right now, or we're not using yet. The first thing I want to do is do a horizontal check. So this is going to be your eyes. So we'll say four, let i equal zero, i is less than three, i plus plus. If, and then we can just call our equals three function. And we can say board i zero, if this, and board i one, and then board i two and you can see how as i increments it'll go through all three of these so if that then the winner is equal to whatever is in this board position so we're not even doing a comparison to see if this is an o or an x because we already know it's not blank we'll just grab whatever it is and put it in the winner 
and we'll let our logic save us for the rest of the day. We can now come out of this for loop and now let's do our vertical check. For this we'll say for let, and let's use j just so it's clear, let j equal zero, j is less than three, j plus plus. And you can see this is probably gonna be similar, so I'm just gonna copy this if statement, and we're gonna say zero, and this needs to be j, one, and this needs to be j, and two, and this needs to be j, and we're just going to grab the zero j position. The last thing we need to do is our two diagonal checks. So diagonal check. And for this, we're gonna say, um, similarly to this right here, we need to do an equals three. So I'm gonna copy this again. So if our uh, board at, we need zero, zero, one, one, two, two, I believe then we're just gonna grab the zero, zero. Similarly, uh, we need the, what, the top right, which is going to be zero, or two comma zero, right? So two, zero, one, one, zero, two. Then let's just grab the uh, two, zero, and set that in our winner. Now let's do something like a double for loop. So for, uh, let's just grab this one right here. For i equals zero, i is less than three, i plus plus. And then we'll say for j equals zero, j is less than three, j plus plus. And then we'll close both of these braces. In here, if the board at i, j is equal to empty, then we know this is an open spot, so we'll increment our open spots just to keep a counter of how many open spots we have. Next, we'll check if we've uh, set a winner or not. So if winner is null, then we don't have a winner yet, and our open spots is equal to zero, then we don't have a winner and there's no more moves available because nothing on the board is the empty string. So that means our result is equal to tie. Else, our result is equal to the winner, uh, winner, because we're checking the first condition is if the winner is null. So if neither of these are true, then it means that we do have a winner. So now let's say if result does not equal null, first thing we need to do is say no loop to stop the loop again. Uh, game in progress equals false. Current player equals null because nobody is the current player now. And we'll say, if the result is a tie, we need to set some text. So we'll say result text dot inner HTML equals tie. Else it's, you know, we have a winner. So then result text dot inner HTML equals, and we'll use some back ticks here. These are on the tilde on an American US keyboard, English, whatever. Uh, and we'll say result inside of this to grab the result variable wins. You could also just append the result variable to wins using some string concatenation. Uh, and then we'll move down one and we'll say, uh, once we've done that, we'll set the score of result. And we're not, we don't have this function yet, of course, so we still need to do that. Uh, in this next part, as I'm looking at it, I'm thinking we can probably refactor this a bit uh, into these existing loops. It's a bit redundant, but it is a little bit easier to read. I think that's why I went with it like this. Um, but basically we're saying if the result is null, return true, else return false, because we're using check winner inside of our Booleans. So if the result is null, we're returning true to say, yeah, there's no winner. Uh, if the result is false, then we're saying, no, there is a winner, so stop trying to, you know, make a move. And now that that's done, we can actually handle our computer player's turn, uh, which is not nearly as involved as this check winner function. So for this, we just say function next turn. If the current player is equal to the computer, 
then let the available equal an empty array. And for this, we need to say four, let i equal zero, i is less than three, i plus plus. And if you're ever thinking about making a terrain engine, um, this is basically what 90% of it is, is just a whole bunch of for loops. But, you know, usually it's um, three dimensionals even. So you're working with just a whole bunch of fours. And that's why, um, yeah, you know, it's a lot more involved than just saying, I, I want to make a game with blocks, unfortunately, speaking from experience here. Uh, so we create our two loops and then we say, if the move is available at I comma J, then we need to push to our available array. So we'll say available dot push, but we're going to create a, uh, some braces right here. And then we'll push in I J and you'll see why in a second here. So now we come out of this, we come out of our four loops, which I think are these right here. And then we say, let move equal random inside of our available. So if you're using a better algorithm, like a min max to make sure your computer never lost, this is where you would change it. We're just using a random move here though. And now we have move in our variable. So we can say board. And then our first one is going to be move.i, which is why we uh, created it like this and pushed in our i's and j's. And then we could say move.j, which allows us to access these outside of our loop. And then our current player is equal to human. We set the array at the i j position to be equal to an x, and then we move back to a human player. Now we need to create our set score function, which takes in a result. It's going to have a switch on the result, which is going to have a case for the human, which is going to be score zero plus equals one, break, case for the computer, score one plus equals one, break, and then the default, which is just going to be your, um, how you deal with a tie basically, which is just going to be score two plus equals one break. Next, we come out of our switch and we say, set the score text, something else we haven't created yet, and then update the scores passing in the result. And that's going to be our remote call right there. So now we'll set the score text. So say function, uh, set, score text, which doesn't take in anything. And we'll just say score text dot inner HTML equals back ticks. So on the tilde again, uh, score zero. Oops, score zero wins slash score one losses slash score two ties. And as I'm looking at this, this is where you're going to run into your remote call issue. So because you're not moving this back from the server after you push this, uh, this is going to be pluralized if either of these or if any of these are one, it's going to say one wins, one losses, one ties, which doesn't really read right. Uh, so you'd probably want to do like a create or uh, played.js.erb that updates this after the controller does something. Okay, but now we're going to do a function called update scores, takes in a result. Oops, a result. It's going to have a, a var for the form data equal to a new form data. A switch for the result again. And we can actually just grab this whole switch right here. So I'm just going to copy this and paste it. Uh, but instead of doing score zero, we're going to say form data dot append a win comma one. And then we'll grab this, paste it in two more times. This is going to be a loss and this is going to be a tie. And the reason we're doing it from uh, we're doing it like this is because inside of our controller. Pages controller, we have our params right here set to win, loss, and tie, and that's where they're coming from. And because we're using this sort of like an API, uh, we don't want to, you know, pass in anything that might change here. So we might change these names or something. We want this to be win, loss, tie, because we're obeying the API so that if anything changes here, it changes in the game.html and not in the pages controller, unless we change it in the pages controller. 
Uh, you don't want to be passing in something where like this could change. And then every time you change this, you have to change your controller as well. That doesn't really flow as well as doing like your front end changes in the front end and your middleware changes in the middleware. So this, you know, it sort of forces you to conform to better practices. We're then going to grab the form data and append an authenticity token. And you need this in Rails just to make sure that this is an authentic form and not some uh, weird stuff that someone's trying to do to, uh, you know, scam out your users or anything. So for this, you call uh, form underscore authenticity underscore token just to make sure that your form is authentic and that no one's using any sort of XSS nonsense. And we say var request equals new XML HTTP request. Request dot open a post request to localhost port 3000 slash played. Uh, and this needs to be inside of quotes with HTTP colon slash slash in front of it. And then request.send the form data. And that's it for the update scores. And I think that might actually be it for a lot of this. I think we might be missing one function. So just give me a second to find it. Oh, this looks good. So let's go ahead and let's refresh this and see what happens. Oh, we still have these two, so let's get rid of those. Save this, refresh. Okay, so I'm gonna click and nothing's happening. So I'm gonna hit F12 and see what our error is. Move available is not defined. Let me just do a control F for move available. Okay, so where is this? Game at 154. This is below I equals and J equals. So I think this is in our click, makes sense. I didn't call it move available, did I? Where is it? Did I even draw? I didn't create the uh, move available function. Okay. <laughs> okay, so let's do a function move available. Takes in an I position and a J position. We got there eventually. Uh, we'll say let result. And then if the I position is greater than two or the J position is greater than two, or the I position is less than zero, or the J position is less than zero. So just making sure it's a valid move inside the uh, tic-tac-toe board. If any of those return false, it's not a valid move. Oops, return false. Else, it is a valid move, so it's inside of the board at least. So then we can say the result is equal to board at I position j position is equal to the empty string. So if it's equal to the empty string, this will be true, which means the result is true, which means we'll return, this actually should have been result, we'll return true. If it's not equal to the empty string, it could be an O or an X, which means this does not equal the empty string. So an O does not equal the empty string. So this is false. And then down here, we just say return result. Cool. So now if we did that correctly, we should be able to refresh. I'll close the console so we have a bit more to work with. I'll click here, X moves here, interesting. I'll click in the middle, X moves there. I should block, X moves there. Uh, and then it looks like I've just won the game. And you can see in here, as soon as I won, it sent this post request, which updated the users. And because we're not updating this from the server side, this is now incorrect. It says one wins instead of one win. But if I refresh our Rails code, we'll fix that. So that is something you could consider. I'll leave that as an exercise for you guys because it's really not that hard to fix this, even with just a simple if statement in the JavaScript. Uh, but now if I refresh, you know, it's still there. Same, same logic. I can hit space to start a new game which sort of lets me cheat, because if I see that I'm losing, I can hit space. Um, but, you know, that's just how this sort of works. This is a tie, so now we have one win, one loss, and one tie. That's pretty cool. Let's come over to our high scores, which I don't think we've created yet, and let's just do that real quick. So I'll come into App, Views, Pages, High Scores, and we'll just create these real fast, and then we should be good to go. Uh, so we'll say Container. 
Jumbotron. This should have an H1. Oops, that should have been a um, H1 tag. There we go. And let's give this H1 a style equal to text align center. Oops. Center. And uh, let's just say all time high scores. Make it sound like it's super, super cool to be on there. And we'll say at users dot each and then dot width underscore index do allows us to do something like user comma index. And then we can use this index to show which rank the user is. So let's create a P tag, close the P tag. And then here we can say rank number index plus one colon. So this user, user dot username is rank one or rank two, whatever. And they've one has one pluralize user dot wins. And then we'll say game and it should pluralize that for us has won, like, let's say maybe they've won 10 games. And then we can say, uh, we'll take this a bit further. So out of, and then let's do how many games they've won. So pluralize the user dot wins plus the user dot losses plus the user dot ties. And then we'll say game again. So they've won that many games out of that many games played. And we can save that. So now let's refresh the high scores. So rank one, Dean has won one game out of three games played. Let me go play another one real quick. Block the X's. And the X totally outplayed me there. I didn't even stand a chance. I've now, um, let me come into the high scores. I've won one game out of four games played. So I'm clearly not really good at this. So let's create a new account. Let's say test, or no, let's call it like top ticker at tick tack toe dot go and we'll give it a password of password so top ticker will be up here sure save it and let's play a few games as top ticker so that's one win um that's two wins that's three wins four wins okay that's you know let's maybe lose one uh I've I've managed to only <laughs> I've managed to force myself into a win. Whatever. Let's come into the high scores now. So top ticker has won five games out of five games played. Uh, they're clearly a far better tic tac toer than I'll ever be. Uh, but you can see now, you know, that's pretty cool. We have a whole high score system set up here for our basic little game. You could have, of course use this for any other setup. Uh, it doesn't have to be tic tac toe. It's just the example I went with for this project. Um, but I hope this helped you guys. I'm going to now go ahead and cut to the outro so that we can, uh, you know, finish off this video. Okay, so that's going to do it for this week's 20 and 20 project. Um, I hope you guys got some value out of this, that you learned a lot about making your own game high scores, or maybe you were just entertained while you were eating some ramen. Uh, I'm not sure what we're doing next week. Um, you know, I have a lot more going on, but hopefully I'll have time for a couple more videos. Uh, but yeah, that's going to do it for me. If this video helped you, please remember to like it. It does help me out. It helps out the channel. Uh, also remember to dislike it if you didn't like it, because we don't want to subject other people to more bad tutorials. Uh, you know, it always helps me out when I see a video rated at like an 80%, because then I know that video is not that good. Uh, and if that's the only video available for a subject, then at least I know that I'm in for a rough ride so I can prepare myself mentally. Uh, but yeah, that's going to do it for me. Um, I look forward to seeing you guys in the comments and in the future videos. So, you know, consider subscribing if you haven't already done that. All that shameless plugging that YouTubers do. Uh, and I will see you guys in the next video. Thank you so much for watching.